Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon in person and virtually. My name is Raheem Thompson. I am the manager of public programs. On behalf of our CEO, Susan Abrams, and the entire museum, I would like to thank you all for joining us for this afternoon's book and out author program, The Nazi's Granddaughter, How I Discovered My Grandfather Was a War Criminal. Sylvia Fulte is an award-winning investigative journalist in Chicago and a high school literature teacher. She holds a master's degrees in journalism, education, and creative nonfiction. Sylvia made a deathbed promise to her mother to write a book about her grandfather. However, Sylvia's grandmother begged her not to write about her husband. Just let history lie, she whispered. Sylvia had no idea that in keeping her promise to her mother, her discoveries would bring her to a personal crisis, challenge her Catholic faith, unearth Holocaust denial, and expose an, unofficial, an official cover-up by the Lithuanian government. The Nazi's granddaughter is Sylvia's third book. Her goal in writing this story of her grandfather, known as General Storm in Lithuania is to upend Lithuania's narrative that Lithuanians had nothing to do with killing Jews and that it was all done by German Nazis. I would like to bring on the stage Sylvia Foti, um, and I hope you all enjoy the program. And thanks again for joining us. Um, thank you for coming. I'm honored that you're here. And um, I'm very pleased and honored that the Illinois Holocaust Museum has invited me to present the findings of my book. And um, I have a PowerPoint presentation. And I will be reading some excerpts from my book along the way. And then afterwards, I'll be having a discussion with Raheem, and then that'll be open to questions from the audience as well. So let's start, right? Oop, went too far. Okay, so the title of the book is The Nazi's Granddaughter, How I Discovered My Grandfather Was a War Criminal. And I thought I would just uh, introduce Lithuania a little bit. I keep hearing how a lot of people don't really have a context for it. So you can see Lithuania's here and uh, it's part of Europe, surrounded by Belarus, Poland, Latvia, Russia's over here, Baltic Sea. So that just gives you a little geography and this is um, a very, very brief history of Lithuania. Uh, started about 1000 AD, lived under Polish and Russians for centuries, became a de democratic state, uh, World War I, 1918. And then it briefly had 22 years of freedom. Uh, then in 1940, it was occupied by the Soviet Union, 1941, Nazis. Um, and then 44 to 90, again, the Soviets. Uh, it became free again in 1990. So, so far it's had 32 years of freedom. And I grew up in Market Park, south side of Chicago, known as Little Lithuania. Um, I grew up only speaking Lithuanian uh, for the first five years um, in the house. And when I went to kindergarten, I still couldn't speak English. And this was a proud thing for Lithuanians to do. My mom felt very proud about this and as did other mothers. And um, it was sort of a little bubble of Lithuania inside Market Park. And so I'm here with my mom and my grandmother and they did play a huge role in this book. So here's just a little bit of background of Holocaust in Lithuania before I get into my own personal story. Um, on June 22nd, 1941, the Nazis invaded Lithuania with Operation Barbarossa. And this essentially was the beginning of the Holocaust. Uh, at that time, Lithuania had about 200,000 Jews. Lithuania has 3 million people. 
uh, of those Jews, 96.4% were murdered, and it's the highest percentage in all of Europe. So if you were Jewish in Lithuania, it was the worst country to be Jewish in Lithuania. You had very, very little chance of surviving. And most were killed by December 1941. And most were killed uh, by bullets. So it was just one by one by one. Uh, and Lithuania, unfortunately, has about 200 death pits of Jews all across the country. And I grew up always hearing about Lithuanians anti-Nazi resistance, but in my research, I came across these facts that sort of rebutted the narrative. Uh, they only had about 600 to 1,000 Nazis in Lithuania throughout the Nazi occupation. Lithuanians did have guns but not a single Nazi was ever killed. So my, you know, I didn't know I was writing a book about this, but it turns out that um, it's a study on Holocaust distortion, which is different from denial. Uh, denial is, as you know, uh, saying that it never actually happened, but because 96.4% of Jews were killed in Lithuania, they can't say it didn't happen. So what happens is that it's a form of distortion in that saying the narrative is that Lithuanians had absolutely nothing to do with the Holocaust, that it was all the Nazis. Um, so until the year 2000 is when, when I got involved with all this, um, all I knew at that point was that my grandfather was a hero because he fought so bravely against the communists. Um, Today, I would say that my book is a study in glamorizing a perpetrator by hiding his deeds through a grand lie by making him a superhero in the country. And I don't know if this was done consciously or subconsciously by the country. Um, my guess is that right after the Holocaust, it was covered up consciously and then it was just the lie was repeated so often that today people don't know what the truth is. And so everybody just keeps repeating that narrative. So the book is about my grandfather, Jonas Nareka. And um, he died in a KGB prison in 1947. Um, he was in that prison for about a year, tortured. Uh, with interrogations and died with two bullets to his head and then his body tossed in a mass grave. He was brought into that prison because he tried to lead a rebellion against the Soviets in 1945 to 46. And that was when he was calling himself General Storm. He only had the rank of a captain. So the, 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 uh, it was just a code name that he gave himself, General Storm, because he was trying to lead this rebellion. They lost, but while he was doing that, um, he was betrayed, and then that's how he ended up into the KGB prison. So this part's true. This part's very heroic for any Lithuanian, and um, it was for this that he was he was uh, lionized so much in the country, and. Before that, he was in a Nazi concentration camp from 1943 to 1945. And um, before that, he was head of the Cholet district from 41 to 43, and this is the Nazi occupation. So he had a rather high role as a Lithuanian during the Nazi occupation. And all of that has been downplayed um, until, until I started doing my research. Before that, he led an uprising against the Soviets in 1941 and won. And um, as a result, he has a school and streets named after him, and he has a plaque on a famous building in Vilnius. So this is him. It's a colorized version. I grew up with this picture on my dining room wall in black and white. And uh, he lived from 1910 to 1947, died at the age of uh, 36, so very young man. And um, the question is whether he really is a hero or a villain. And 
you know, it, it occurred to me, uh, you know, as a journalist who's very image conscious, that his good looks, I think, played a role in deceiving what he really did. And, you know, sometimes when I present like uh, to students on this, I'll, you know, ask them, how do you think his looks played a role in uh, deceiving that he was just a hero? And I've had students say, oh, he looks like Superman, you know, or he's so good looking, he could never do anything bad. Um, and so there is this power behind his good looks, I think, that like contributes to the myth of this. So this was in 1997. Uh, my mom received the cross of the VTS from President Brzezowskis at the time. And that is the highest honor you could receive posthumously. So this is like the imprimatur, you know, of him being a hero. And uh, I'm there with my brother in the middle and mom is to the side of us. And we were just so proud. This was truly a very proud moment for the entire family, um, you know, when mom was receiving this cross of the Vitas. Um, I wanted to introduce a character in the, uh, you know, a real person in the story. His name is Damiona Srauka. He um, has passed away, but he, he played a big role in this book being written in a way, because as I was growing up, my mom was asked to write a book about her father. And a lot of that push came from this man, Damiona Srauka, who... Uh, worked with my grandfather in 1941 during that uprising. And he somehow made it his life's mission to collect as much material as he could on Jonas Nareka. And he kept sending this stuff to my mother all along. And so this is his archive that he was showing me from Kalmas. And um, he... Uh, par part of the archive includes the KGB transcripts of my grandfather. When he, when he was in that prison, you know, they interrogated him and say what you will about the Russians, they recorded, you know, everything that was said. And so there were 3,000 pages of these KGB transcripts of my grandfather, and they're in Russian. And mom doesn't speak Russian, so she asked Damionas to translate it all into Lithuanian. So that's one of the things, and she paid him, and that's one of the things that he did. So um, when I started this uh, project, part of part of the art, my mother's archives were these three thousand pages that he put together, along with just a whole bunch of other material. And um, I thought I would uh, read a little excerpt uh, in between from the book. And so uh, I'm going to turn to pages 83 to 84 and just read a little bit. Chapter 11, the KGB transcripts. I contemplated the 3,000 pages of KGB transcripts sitting in front of me. My hope was that they would yield details of my grandfather's rebellion against the communists during the second Soviet occupation, and that this task would serve as a welcome delay in my investigation of the rumor. Somehow, my mother had managed to obtain these Russian documents shortly after Lithuania's independence in 1990. It seems that she had bribed someone to make copies, asked a friend to smuggle them from Vilnius to Chicago, and then mailed the transcripts copies to Damiona Zrauka, her father's colleague during the five-day uprising against the first Soviet occupation to be translated into Lithuanian. She had paid him thousands of dollars for this service. Damionas was also my mother's volunteer clipping service agent. He had taken it upon himself to cut out articles about her father and to send them to her accompanied by lengthy letters. I remember her occasionally over the course of nearly a decade mentioning the arrival of these packets to me. Last week it was three, this week another two, she had remarked. He just never stops. It's been like this for years. I can't even bear to open up his envelopes anymore. I now understood how overwhelmed she must have felt. Damionas continued zealously in his role as a provider of both old and recent clippings, even after my mother's death. 
My grandfather remained a subject of interest in the fatherland and the articles concerning Jonas Nareka were accompanied by letters of detailed instructions as to how I should write my book. I winced at the arrival of each new package. My mother had organized the three hole punched KGB transcript pages into five thick white binders. I had hoped that their contents would follow a chronological order beginning with my grandfather's first interrogation after his capture by the KGB in March 1946 and ending with the last, shortly before his execution on February 26, 1947. But the transcripts weren't so easily organized. Jonas Nareka was one of 11 rebels who stood trial together. Their testimony too was included. Attempting to follow the threads of the various accounts was like trying to analyze a spider web. Nearly every page of the type Lithuanian translations bore Dami Jonas's handwritten commentary in the margins or between the lines. I found myself having to read each page two or three times. So I'm gonna stop there. So this is how the story really started. It's kind of the beginning. Um, my mom had been working on this book about her father for 40 years. And um, she collected just all that material and which was included those 3000 pages of those KGB transcripts from when he was interrogated and tortured. Uh, she also had 77 letters from the Stutthof concentration camp that my grandfather had written to my grandmother. And there was also a little fairy tale that he wrote from that concentration camp for my mother. Um, so my, ma my mom uh, was in the hospital and, um, you know, she had a bad back and diabetes and she was only 60 years old. So um, I, and she was in there in and out for, at the hospital lots of times for tests. And I thought it was just one more test. But this time she looked not good. And, um, you know, I walk into the room and uh, she's, you know, she says, Sylvia, come over here. And I take her hand and she says, uh, you have to write the book. And I knew exactly what book, you know, she's talking about. Uh, I was a journalist at the time. Now I'm a high school English teacher. And I still was not accepting what was going on. And I said, no, 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 mom, you're, you're going to write the book. Everything's going to be fine. Uh, and, and again, she's squeezing my hand. You have to, everybody expects it. So um, I was more upset that she was dying, of course. But, um, you know, when your mom is dying and she's asking you to do something on her deathbed, you only can give her one answer. And so, of course, I said yes. So that's how it started. So uh, my grandmother, this is her horsing around with Jonas Nareka uh, before they're married. I, I love this picture. Um, so my grandmother survived my mother five months. And uh, so after my mom died, I collected all that material, brought it over to my house. And now my grandmother is, uh, she didn't live too far away from me. And now she's not feeling good. She had, I don't know, her third heart attack or something. And I went to visit her. And uh, she, she's asking me, Sylvia, what's going on with the book? And I said, uh, don't worry, Machita, I'll, I'll get it done. I'm not going to let it go the way mom did. And I was thinking I'm giving her words of comfort because I thought she was worried that the book was not going to be written again. And she surprised me by saying, don't write the book. Just let history lie. There's no need to dig around. And at the time I had no idea what she meant. I thought still, you know, maybe she didn't want me to have to deal with the stress of this like insane deathbed promise. That's, a, that's about all I could come up with as to why she would say something like that. So, uh, so mom died February. Uh, Mochuta, my grandmother died in July. And now it's October, so this is all the same year, the year 2000, and they both wanted to be buried in Lithuania. 
And so my brother and I uh, brought them to Lithuania and buried them there on October 8, 2000. And we chose that date because uh, it would have been the 90 year memorial birthday of Jonas Nareka. And so we were finally thinking, you know, that nuclear family is gonna be finally reunited together, at least in death. Um, and you can see, um, this is, this is Vital Pelos Landsberges who came to visit at the funeral. And he uh, was like the first, I'm not, he wasn't exactly the president, there's another name for it, but he was like the first president of Lithuania. And he's a really big deal in Lithuania. And for him to show up, we were, we were like, oh my gosh. And, you know, there were several hundred people there and everybody stopped talking when he walked in and photographers were taking pictures. And we were just so honored um, that he came to pay his respects. So, uh, sorry. So I wanted to introduce another character person in the book. This is Viktoras Ashmenskas. He was also a colleague of my grandfather um, for the second rebellion. Damionis was with the first rebellion and Viktor Slashmanskis is with the Second Occupation Rebellion. And he, had, he was also in the KGB prison with my grandfather as one of the 11 that were trying to lead this rebellion. And he wrote a book, he had written a book about my grandfather prior that was published in 1997, um, funded by the Genocide Center, which I'm gonna explain more about that group. But anyway, he also played a big role. He was a friend of the family and a colleague of uh, our grandfather. And he was also trying to help us a lot. So um, after the funeral, he's the one who got this plaque on this building in Vilnius. It was, uh, it was under uh, his idea and somehow he got it done. So this is the, bill, this is, uh, the Roblewski Library today. And uh, it's in a prominent area in Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania. And uh, my grandfather worked at that time, he was a lawyer slash, you know, army per, uh, captain. And he, he worked in this building during that resistance. So that's why they put the plaque on this building. And uh, the plaque says, in this building, 1945, 1946, worked a noteworthy resistor, Lithuania's National Council, Lithuania's Armed Forces Organizer and Leader, Jonas Nareka, General Storm, shot February 26, 1947. Uh, in our family, we grew up hearing how he wanted to be shot February 26, uh, 16, because that's uh, the grandest day in Lithuania. It was uh, Lithuania's independence but the, the KGB wouldn't let him be shot on that day. So they, mo they moved it 10 days later. And it was like, you know, another thing that the horrible Russians did. So after all that, uh, we went to visit the Jonas Nareka Grammar School, which was renamed in the 1990s. And uh, you can see this uh, middle says, uh, Jay Noreko's Gimtina, his birthplace, one kilometer away. So you kind of get a little warning, and then this is kind of his birthplace, and they, they uh, in Shukone, and they named the school after him. And then there's like another plaque in his honor here, and, and we're here kind of honoring him again. So my brother and I were right after the funeral, were invited by the school to come visit as the grandchildren of the school's namesake. And we came and, um, you know, they had the, the, the grammar school kids with flowers and singing beautiful Lithuanian songs. And, you know, we were gre uh, greeted like rock stars as we came in. It was a very grand um, acceptance. And then we go into the director's office and he's showing us scrapbooks of Jonas Nareka and we're going through it. And he says to me, um, so I heard you writing this book about Jonas Nareka that you took over the writing project from your mom. And I said, I did. And he said, that's so good. You're such a good daughter. Our country really needs its heroes. And I said, thank you. Um, and then I said, you know, like I'm already thinking about the book and trying to act like the journalist, you know, I was, uh, I never really knew the story 
of how you named the school after my grandfather. Uh, why don't you tell me? And he said, well, before 1990, when we were occupied by uh, the Russians, we had this horrible Russian name. And after Lithuania got its independence, we wanted a good Lithuanian patriotic name. And your grandfather, this magnificent hero who was born in this small town, of course we named the school after him, it's only natural. And I thought, okay, I thought that was the end of the story. But then he pulls me to the side and he says, but you know, I got a lot of grief from the, uh, I got a lot of grief over naming the school after your grandfather. And I said, grief from who? And he says, from the Jews. I'm like, what could the Jews possibly say about my wonderful, magnificent, legendary grandfather, whom I love so much? And uh, he looks at me as if I should know this. And he said, well, he was accused of killing Jews. And I'm like, I, you know, that was the, I was 38 then. And I said, what, you know, like I was just in shock. I was just in total shock. And I had to sit down and kind of like, I, like I'm like, my mind is blown. I'm freaked out. I, I just cannot believe this. And um, so I thought I would read an excerpt of that moment. Okay. So this is from chapter eight, a tarnished halo. My brother and I were delighted to arrive at the Jonas Nareka Grammar School. It was a modest white brick building with oak trim. Hundreds of children must have run through its halls and sat in its classrooms, learning about my grandfather's World War II exploits as we had done at our grandmother's feet. Viktor Sashmenskas, imposing in his decorated Lithuanian Air Force uniform, had arranged for our welcome as honorary guests. We had been asked to distribute prizes to the winners of the student races held to mark our grandfather's 90th birthday. The school director, Boleslova Stalat Kelpcha, a stout man with disheveled white hair, grasped our hands energetically, saying how pleased he was that we had come to host the ceremony. At his direction, the students holding flowers lined the halls to greet us as we entered the building. Talat Kelpcha offered us frothy mugs of beer we could hardly refuse, though it was not yet noon. Ray and I were led to his office, where he proudly showed us a thick scrapbook filled with articles about our illustrious ancestor. Many of the clippings included the familiar photograph of Jonas Nareka arrayed in his military uniform. We had seen this picture every day of our childhoods. I set down my beer to flip through the album's pages. The headlines were repetitive. General Vetra, I want to die on February 16th in memory of General Azdetra. A monument will stand in Shukone. The directors, secretaries, teachers, and children all looked on, a, on us as Ray and I perused the book. Our mother had similar scrapbooks of our grandfather, I told the director in our native tongue. He patted me on the back. I can imagine, I heard you were writing a book on Jonas Nareka that you have taken over the task from your mother. How wonderful. How did you decide to name the school after him, I asked. He stroked his chin and answered, it was during a meeting of the county board. We wanted to pick a new name to replace the Russian one. Your grandfather's name surfaced immediately. Then abruptly, he pulled me and my brother's side, lowering his voice, he confided, I got a lot of grief at first when we picked his name. The comment perplexed me, but all eyes were still upon me as if I were a great celebrity. I struggled to conceal my confusion. He was accused of being a Jew killer, whispered the director. My eyes met Ray's. He too was aghast. Accused of being a Jew killer? What could the director mean? Had we heard correctly? I studied his face for a moment, feeling off balance, then looked around the room at the teachers and others assembled. Who were all these people? And who was I? Or my mother? Or my grandmother? Or my grandfather? My mind whirled in disbelief. There must be some mistake. It can't be true. The school director was still talking to me, but I couldn't hear him. I felt as if he were speaking from the other side of a long and winding tunnel. He clearly expected a response from me, but I was at a loss for words or even for thought. I didn't want to have a conversation about the possibility that my grandfather was a Jew killer. It felt as if my brain were doing somersaults. 
As my legs seemed about to buckle, I grabbed a chair and plopped down heavily, breathing deeply to stop my heart from sprinting, every nerve in my body at military attention. The director stroked my arm reassuringly. I'm getting more support now than ever from Lithuanians for choosing your grandfather's name. Everything is fine now. All of that is in the past, just communist propaganda. We're so happy you and your brother have come to help celebrate the Olympiad. I stammered an inane reply. I wanted him to stop talking, to take what he had said. I wanted never to have heard it. Why would he say such a thing? My mother and grandmother had never mentioned any such accusation, nor had anyone else I knew. My legendary grandfather was part of my identity, my DNA. I felt such shame at hearing him accused of being a Jew killer, shame I didn't want to face. My grandfather was a hero, he was. Feeling lost, I couldn't wait for the ceremony to end. So that was the big moment that changed my life. <laughs> I just did that. Um, so then after that, I came back home to Chicago and just kind of tried to figure out what to do next. And I talked to my father and other members of the Lithuanian community. And I'm like, did you ever hear this crazy rumor of Jonas Nareka killing Jews? And they're all like, yeah, we heard it. I'm like, what? And I'm like, why, why, wouldn't you, why didn't you ever tell me anything? And they said, well, it's not true. Why would we talk about it? It's not true. It's just kind of this propaganda. You know, the Russians, they just want to take our heroes away. So, um, you know, being a Lithuanian from Market Park, I, I sort of thought that must be it. And um, so I was in denial for about 10 years. I, it was very difficult for me to accept this information. So I understand why the denial is so strong because I actually lived it myself. And, um, but because I was a journalist, you know, I knew I couldn't like completely ignore the room or pretend it didn't exist at all. So I eventually told myself, okay, I'm gonna look into this Nazi rumor and uh, I'm going to exonerate Jonas Nareka once and for all. I'm going to prove that this is not true. So that was my goal. And um, as I was working on the story, at the time I was, I, was a, I was a freelance journalist, but working practically full time, two young children. And I was having a hard time dedicating some serious time to this. And I had to change careers. Um, because I was tired of writing for everybody else and not writing the one big project that I wanted to work on. And so a friend who was a teacher suggested to me, you should become a teacher and you, this way you'll have your summers off. I'm like, oh, okay. So that's the main reason I became a high school teacher was to work on this book. Um, so at about the 10 year mark, you know, I'd been a teacher for three years already. I had, you know, by this point, dedicated three summers to this. And, you know, teachers get, get two weeks of the winter break and a spring break, which is, you know, more than, the, you know, I was getting as a journalist. And so I was having more time already with it. And now, now I'm kind of like thinking about this more and more. And uh, I'm ready to really look into the Nazi occupation. And I'm, I'm getting ready to like, you know, get myself in the mind frame of studying this. And I was getting ready to improve my writing skills at the time too, which I'll explain. So right about that time in my mom's archive, uh, I found this brochure. And it was not, you know, my mom wasn't a librarian. So it's not like everything was like, she was organized, but it wasn't like super organized. And so it was kind of like put in between these other articles and I'm like picking it up and looking at, I'm like, what is this? And it, Pakal Kalva Yatsuvin means raise your head Lithuanian. And, um, you know, I saw it was written by my grandfather and I just thought, oh, this is just gonna be some patriotic thing about how wonderful it is to be Lithuanian or something like that. And, um, 
he wrote it when he was 22. And except when I started reading it, it's like a four by seven brochure. It's like this little thing and it's all yellowed. And I start reading it and I was really in shock over what I discovered. Here are some quotes from that book. Jews in nice clothes, sit in cafes, thinking how to extract from us as much money as possible. The Jew gives you to earn, but he will find an opportunity to steal from you three times more. Once and forever, do not buy anything from the Jews. Remember, when you sell a big thing to a Jew, you are doing harm. You are harming your brother, an ethnic Lithuanian. If all ethnic Lithuanians had an agreement to boycott the Jew, the life would be much better. Yes, yes, indeed. So, um, you know, it was 32 pages of this. And when I finished, I wanted to burn, you know, as his granddaughter, I wanted to burn the manuscript. Um, but as a journalist, of course, I knew I couldn't. But, you know, I was already thinking, this is going to make it a lot harder to exonerate him. Um, the only, oh, it's not on here. The only thing is, you know, I told myself that he was just 22 years old. Uh, and as, as terrible of what he was suggesting and asking for, he did not ask for the killing of Jews. So uh, that was kind of my little sliver of hope. Um, so I was kind of like hanging onto a straw with that. But really, it has been called the Lithuanian Mein Kampf. Then this is the document that finally took my denial away. Uh, because when he was chair of the district in Chole, he had to write several orders. And this is the order that really uh, shook me. And I took it very seriously as a journalist because it is a primary source document and it has his signature at the bottom and the consequences uh, were utterly devastating. So uh, I have some, wait, did I, I thought I had a, no, I didn't put it in here. Oh, this is a, I, I, have, I have an excerpt I want to read. I'm going to read this, this thing. That's what I wanted to do. So this is on page 108. And um, this is what he asked for in this order. In accordance with this decree, one, Jews of all principalities, secondary towns, and townships must be moved to the town of Jagare in the period of the 25th to the 29th of this month. Requisites for resettlement will be provided by respective municipalities. Two, lists of abandoned Jewish property must be delivered to me in two copies by August 29th. Resettled Jews can take the most necessary household items and clothes and up to 200 Reichsmarks in cash for each Jewish family. Three, in Jagare, all Jews will be settled in a separate district, which has to be fenced off by August 30th. Fencing off the ghetto district will be taken care of by the Jagare municipality. Every day, district Jews in the ghetto will be conveyed to work and back to the ghetto by guards. Four, non-Jewish citizens of the district appointed for the Jews are allowed to choose other locations in the county. If any of those non-Jews who are resettled have to abandon their real estate, they are allowed to choose real estate of corresponding value abandoned by the Jews in Jagare or other townships. Five, chiefs and burgomasters are obliged to inform me on the execution of this degree by the 29th of this month. Jonas Nareka, city and county governor. So um, after I read this, you know, I, I went to find out what happened with these Jews in Jagada, and there were more than 2,000 rounded up from the whole district of Shaole, and uh, they were brought to this ghetto, created under his orders, a brand new ghetto created under his orders, and within two months, these 2,000 Jews were slaughtered. Their property distributed, their homes taken over. And that's when I thought, okay, now, now this is something. 
So, um, that's when I uh, changed, I, I got a second writing degree. Until then, I had a writing degree, you know, in journalism from Northwestern University. And I knew that I didn't have the skill to tell the story the way it needs to be told. So I got another writing degree, an MFA in creative nonfiction, to learn how to write it in this way that is uh, more engaging in the story. Creative nonfiction takes a nonfiction story, but uses all of the tricks that fiction writers use, you know, suspense and tension and characterization and setting and metaphor and irony and, you know, all, the, all these other things that fiction writers do. So they use the fiction writer skills to tell a true story. And that's what I decided I wanted to do. Um, and so after I got my MFA, they let me have this as my thesis statement, as my, <laughs> as my thesis. And so I use this as my thesis, but then when I was done, they said, you know, this is a good start, but you've got a way much more to do. So we think you should go to Lithuania to complete your research and see what happens there. So I'm like, okay, well, I was a high school teacher, so it had to be in the summer. And so I spent seven weeks in Lithuania in the summer of 2013. And I talked to a lot of people. And um, in that time, I discovered that he gave orders to kill 2,000 Jews in Kalunga by mid-1941, 2,000 in Telshe, and 4,000 in Shoge. So that adds up to 8,000 under his watch. There's no evidence that he shot anybody himself. So he would be under the category of desk murderer. Um, and this is kind of a big defense that Lithuanians use for him saying, but he didn't shoot anybody, any of them himself. Well, Hitler didn't shoot any Jews either himself. So, so oh, I talked to you about this. Uh, so I was, you know, I was going to write this as a biography in the journalistic style, and in the end it became a memoir, and that's when it became much more personal, and uh, that's why you'll see a lot of emotional journeys throughout, how I went from denial to acceptance, and then there's sadness and anger and bargaining in between. Um, while I was there, I hired a Holocaust guide. I had a friend um, who was a reporter with the Sun-Times, and he's, he's Jewish, Howard Walensky, and um, he knew about my project. We'd been talking about it for years and years. He knew me, he knew me in this project when I thought my grandfather was still just a hero, uh, so it was even before the year 2000, and uh, so now it's like 2012, right? Uh, 2012, 2013, early 2013. And he came back from a Holocaust trip and he's telling me about it. I'm like, what's a Holocaust trip? I had never heard of such a thing. I'm like, what? And he said, well, you hire a guide to take you to all the places where you think your relatives were killed. And because they're in death pits, there's no, you know, identification exactly of where they are. So you hire a guide to kind of help you. And then you go there and you pray, Kaddish. And I had never knew that this was a thing in Lithuania. And I was really moved by this and his experience and how he told me about this. And I was just thinking about it for several days later. And then I called um, Simon up again, Howard up again. And I said, Howard, I have a really, really crazy idea. Do you think your Holocaust guide would take me on a Holocaust tour of all the places where maybe Jonas Nareka was involved in killing Jews? And uh, at first, Simon did not. Uh, how, how, Howard said, for, well, first, Howard said, that's a really crazy idea. But it's so crazy, it's good. <laughs> And then he said, I don't know, I'll talk to Simon. So he, he calls, he talks to Simon and Simon at first said, no, he didn't like the idea. 
But then Simon started uh, researching Jonas Nureka, and then and by this point we're emailing, and Simon says, you know, there's a lot going on with your grandfather, and, and despite myself, I'm intrigued with his story, and now I want to do this with you. So, uh, so I was very pleased that we paired up and did this together. And so Simon uh, played a big role in helping me understand how the Holocaust happened in Lithuania. And um, here we're at the Holocaust Museum in Vilnius. And Simas died like uh, 15 or 16. So I, I'm very sad that he's not around anymore. He was the head of the Sugihara Museum, the director of the Sugihara Museum. And uh, Sugihara was a Japanese ambassador who, uh, despite all orders from Japan, was giving out Japanese visas to Jews to escape to Japan. And so I think he saved like 2,000 Jews. I'm not sure the exact number. So now there's a museum uh, to Sugihara in Kaunas and the Simus was the director of it. So now I'm gonna read you another excerpt. This is chapter 30, the Holocaust map. Seeking to finally confirm or dispel my worst fears about my grandfather's complicity in the mass murders of Jews, I had hired Simon Dovidovich's as a guide to help me tour various local Holocaust sites. We agreed to meet in Vilnius at a hotel he had recommended. It was a 10 minute walk from the city's old town and more modestly priced than those in busier tourist areas. After booking my room there, I found a transportation company that took passengers from Klaipeda to Vilnius and a van designed to accommodate nine people. The other passengers and I were somewhat cramped, but as I kept telling myself during the four hour drive, this was less expensive than engaging a private chauffeur. chauffeur. Once I had checked into the hotel, I was pleased to discover that it had a sauna. I immediately made an appointment. That evening, over a restaurant dinner, Simon and I discussed our ambitious seven-day itinerary. We would visit multiple sites in Vilnius, Kaunas, Plunge, Telche, Shaule, and Jagare. For the sake of economy, we agreed that we'd stay at my apartment in Klaipeda for the second half of the trip. We had eyed each other curiously at the beginning of the meal in disbelief and perhaps bemusement. Yet in a situation that should have felt strained, we formed an unlikely alliance. It turned out that we genuinely enjoyed each other's company. Simon told me that I was the second Lithuanian client who had come to him concerned about a relative's involvement in anti-Semitic atrocities. As the director of Sugihara House and a tour guide knowledgeable about Holocaust sites, Simon was often confronted with sensitive issues and emotionally challenging circumstances. Most of the people who engaged his services were Jews trying to locate relatives burial sites. Sometimes all I can do is lead them to a pit and say, this is my best guest, he said with a shrug of res resignation. How sad. The next morning after hotel breakfast of cold cuts, boiled eggs, black bread and herring, we drove to the Holocaust Exposition in Vilnius. Simon was committed to providing me with as much background information as possible. At the Holocaust Exposition, he pointed out the black triangles spread across a huge map of Lithuania. They were congregated in bunches around the cities and scattered throughout the rural areas, indicating the graves of Jews who had been murdered mainly between June and December 1941. There were more than 200 triangles, each of them representing hundreds of bodies. I had looked at maps of Lithuania all my life and was familiar with how the country's contours had changed throughout the various periods of its history. At one time, the country's borders had extended from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea. Later, its boundaries represented merely by a dotted line within the Soviet Union. At another time, Lithuania's bottom Eastern third had been chopped off by Poland which had occupied even the country's beloved capital, Vilnius. I had seen a map with dots signifying the number of Lithuanians sent to Siberia, another in which the dots denoted Lithuanians who had fled the country during the communist invasion, and yet another showing how many Catholic churches had been converted into atheist museums. But I had never seen a map of Holocaust sites. It was staggering. Simon introduced me to an entirely new perspective, one blithely ignored by most Lithuanians, 
who were intent upon avoidance of any reckoning with their history vis-a-vis -vis the Jews. I understood their position. I myself hadn't given the matter any thought before my mother's deathbed request. Now, after 13 years of research, skepticism, and agonizing doubt, I was finally prepared to hear the truth. All right, so while I was there, I also interviewed um, this director of the Genocide Center, Genocide Resistance Research Center. And she, uh, Teresa Boroskaita, was the director of this. And um, this, of course, is the whole building. And this building is mostly dedicated to studying the Soviet occupation. And just to go back, this is the little building dedicated to studying the Nazi occupation. So you can see like the big difference in, in the culture between the two. Um, so anyway, I got up my nerve. Oh, and I have to give you some background on the Genocide Center. The Genocide Center uh, is the great arbiter of history in Lithuania. So they're the ones who study the, the, the Soviet, the first Soviet occupation, the Nazi occupation, uh, the second Soviet occupation, and they kind of come up with the narrative. There's like a hundred state sponsored historians paid by the government to study the history of Lithuania. So whenever a politician is asked about like something like this, uh, all the politician can say is, I'm just a politician. You know, I can only turn to what the Genocide Center says. They're the ones with the PhDs in history. They're the ones who have all the resources and the means to investigate this. So all roads on this issue always come back to the Genocide Center and how what the Genocide Center says. Uh, so I interviewed Teresa Boroskaita about that document, that August 22nd, 1941 document. I'm like, how could, how could Jonas Nareka still be considered a hero, you know, if he signed this document? And her response was, well, it was difficult to know what was in his heart when he signed the document. And, you know, with my training as a journalist, I'm like, wow, I'm not in Kansas anymore. Uh, you know, uh, so so I, I had a very difficult time, you know, accepting what she just said. And I'm telling Simon, OK, Simon, I think we're done. And Simon kept like pushing and pushing. And so we stayed a little bit longer. But just that response is so indicative of how Lithuania responds to this issue. It's a primary source document. The results are devastating. His signature is on there. And, and all of a sudden, the head of this center, the arbiter of history, says, it's difficult to know what was in his heart. So, so that means he must be innocent. So this is how Holocaust distortion works. Um, so the results of my research, uh, you know, I went to Kaunas Plunge, talked a long time with Damiano Sarauka, the last living witness of the five-day uprising. I spoke with Jakubas Bunka, the last living Jew of Plunge. Um, and a lot of this I had already covered. So in Lithuania, um, in Lithuania, there, the, the big uh, defense is that only the Zhichoje are the guilty ones. And Zhicho just means Jew shooter. And so if, if a Lithuanian was not a Zhicho, just completely innocent. That's kind of the mentality. And so, and the Zhicho were drunk, degenerate, um, and most Lithuanians have heard about somebody in their family or somebody else's family who was a Zhicho just, and they were shunned. So that kind of takes care of the matter for most Lithuanians. So, uh, I was invited 
to speak in Lithuania um, last October about all this. And I was speaking to teachers who uh, teach high school in Lithuania. They're like 30. And so I wanted to kind of have them have a little discussion about this, you know, because it's like a thing in Lithuania about these Zhichoje. And I, and I said, who is the guiltiest in the genocide machine? Let's just take a look at all, and I don't even have all of them. This is just all I could think of like in five minutes to put this slide together. So yes, we have Hitler and the Nazi propaganda at the top. The Holocaust would not have happened without Hitler, true. But then we have Lithuania's provisional government calling for the cleansing of Jews and the Lithuanian activist front helping. Then we have Nazis who wrote orders to segregate and round up Jews. Then we have Lithuanians like my grandfather who translated those orders uh, to round up and uh, confiscate the property of Jews. Then we had Lithuanians who had to identify the Jews in each town. Then we have Lithuanians who had to round up Jews in each town. Then we have Lithuanians who had to guard Jews in the ghetto. Then we have Lithuanians who had to distribute Jewish property. Then we have Lithuanians who took Jews to the pit. Then we have, uh, then finally, finally, we have Lithuanians who shot the Jews. They're the very, very last step. And the only Lithuanians they could get were if they bribed them with like a bottle of vodka or something. And so, uh, or gave them food. And so, you know, I asked, the teachers to get in little groups to talk about, so who's the guiltiest? Who's the guilty one? What do you think the response was? They're all guilty. They're all guilty. It's not just the Zhicho does. So this was kind of a big breakthrough, I thought, you know, for these 30 teachers in Lithuania. What's next? So the book is written. I finally wrote the book. It, it was pretty much finished in 2018. And then um, I met Grant Goshen. And Grant lives in California. He's Jewish, Litvak. And he lost 100 relatives in the Holocaust because of Jonas Nareka. And before I knew him, he had already launched a lawsuit against the Genocide Research Center, which defends the good name of Jonas Nareka. And it turns out that he went through all the courts of Lithuania uh, and he lost like 10 to 15 times. Uh, so all the courts took the genocide center's side. Um, then he filed this lawsuit in the European Court of Human Rights and now, and they, law, and they didn't take it. They're like the Supreme Court here. They only take like one or 2% of cases. So they didn't take this case. Um, so now he's trying to get it into the United Nations. And after I met Grant, the, the way um, Grant and I met was, um, you know, once I had the book written, I had to get a, a, a literary agent. And so um, not only do you have to write a book, you have to have an author platform. I'm like, okay, what's an author platform? So uh, first step is to put together a website. So I put together a website and within days, a researcher from Lithuania, Andrus Kulikauskas, contacts me and says, uh, hello, I'm working for a man by the name of Grant Goshen, who is conducting a lawsuit against the Genocide Center about your grandfather. And, um, and I think you should meet Grant. And I, and you know, I'm like at home in my office reading this and of course I almost fell off my chair and I can't believe how big this thing is getting. And it took me six weeks to summon up the courage to contact Grant because I was really afraid, you know, of what he would say. But, uh, you know, I thought about it and thought about it. And then I finally thought, who is this book for if not for someone like Grant? So uh, I um, contacted him and uh, he was weary of talking to me. Apparently he had, he was stalking me and knew who I was. <laughs> And he, th he thought, he didn't know about my, my research because it wasn't really public yet. And uh, he just knew that I was the granddaughter of Jonas Nareka. And um, when we started talking, he re we both realized we're on the same side. And uh, since then we've become very good friends. So um, 
then we, we, we shared all of our research together. So unbeknownst to me, he was collecting information on Jonas Nareka for this lawsuit. And unbeknownst to him, I was collecting information for this book about Jonas Nareka. And then we met in 2018, and then we hit it off, and then we shared our information with each other. And I realized I had to rewrite the book again after, like, I, I understood what he found, and he had to kind of redesign the lawsuit based on what I found. And so we sort of teamed up. And uh, so as a result, um, in between every chapter of my book is an excerpt of the Genocide Center's response to the lawsuit that Grant had uh, launched against them. So I'm just going to read one little excerpt from it, which is on page nine. The news, October 1st, 2018. The Genocide Center would like to call the court's attention to the fact that S. Fodi, living in the United States, was not a participant in the historical events in question. She was not yet born, nor is she a professional historian. Her opinion about her grandfather is directly opposed to her mother's, Jane Areka's daughter. One can conclude from the published research of S. Fodi that she's not familiar with the accepted methodology of historical research such as that conducted by academic historians, which requires deep critical analysis within a proper historical framework. Vilnius Regional Administrative Court, file number EL4215281, 2018, response from the Genocide Resistance Research Center to the prosecution's claim against the Genocide Center's refusal to change its historical conclusion on Jonas Noreka. So um, what the Genocide Center is doing is part of the his, historical distortion occurring in the country about all this. So one thing that Lithuanians like to point out is that many Lithuanians saved Jews during the Holocaust. And it turns out that there were 900 Lithuanians who saved Jews. And this is a very, very good thing, of course. And they're the righteous uh, at the Yad Vashem. But the problem is, and why it was so devastating, is that 2.9 million Lithuanians did not save Jews. So, uh, and according to the Genocide Center, one of their historians said my grandfather actually helped to save Jews. So um, this plaque has been getting a lot of attention in Lithuania. This is um, a man who was running for the European uh, Parliament. And so I guess as a way to publicize his running for the Parliament, he, this is like four in the morning in Lithuania, he smashed the plaque. And there's a video on this on YouTube. We just, we just weren't able to show it. Uh, so he, he gets on that little rickety uh, ladder, has this big sledgehammer, and like is swinging against the plaque 14 times, you know, and then the plaque is like completely in pieces and um, it's down. So he does this, you know, as a renegade. Like this is not anything that was officially accepted. So guess what happened next? He did go to jail. And yes, brand new and improved flag, even better and bigger than before. <laughs> so um, my argument is Lithuania is now in the 10th stage of denial of genocide, which is denial. And I had an interview with uh, Gregory Stanton, uh, who came up with these 10 stages of genocide. And we talked about Lithuania and all the roles, and I'm, and I'm working on an article about that. But essentially, the Lithuanian narrative is that Lithuanians had nothing to do with killing Jews, that it was all the German Nazis.
Uh, this story has gotten a lot of international coverage, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Chicago Tribune, George Spiegel, Salon.com, BBC. It's in Spanish, it's already out in Spanish. And of course, it came out by Regnery History in March. And it's coming out in Lithuania this February. So I'm going to go to Lithuania for the book launch, COVID permitting. Um, and it's got a new title. This was my original title, uh, Storm in the Land of Rain. So now they're going back to my original title, Vetra Lietal Shalia. It's coming out in Polish and Hungarian. And the English paperback is going to be June 7, 2022. And uh, oh, somehow it cut off. Well, anyway, it's Storm in the Land of Rain. A mother's dying wish becomes her daughter's nightmare. And I guess that's it. We are going to transition really quickly into a quick Q&A discussion, and then we'll save some time for audience questions. So if you have some questions, just uh, prepare them, and I'll run the mics on the floor. Uh, virtually, if you have any questions, please submit them in the Q&A function, and we'll get to those as, as many as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Sylvia, before we begin, um, I just want to congratulate you on this book. I know just reading it, you went through great lengths to get this published, and it was quite the discovery for you personally and professionally in the things you had to overcome to create it. So, so I just want to congratulate you on that first. Thank you, Rahim. All right, first question, and I found this really interesting. Um, you talked about how you struggle with survivor's guilt growing up, and sometimes your family will um, reference like, hey, you are lucky to be born in America. Um, when this when this came out about your grandfather, do you think that slight division kind of influenced how you saw uh, your grandfather and his discovery, how they saw it? Because it seems like you mentioned that you felt that you were the only one kind of curious and pushing for this. Do you think that upbringing kind of played a part in that? I do, um, because I, I was raised in a, in a very patriotic Lithuanian family. And uh, somehow they instilled the idea that it's your job to help Lithuania, even though you're here in Chicago. And you're so lucky to have been born here in Chicago. And you know, poor Lithuanians in Lithuania under uh, the Soviet occupation. Uh, and if it weren't for us having escaped, you could have been born there. So because you were born here, uh, it's your job to do everything you can to help Lithuania. So I did always have that um, really strong patriotic streak about doing something for Lithuania. And, um, and what, I, what I asked her for is because um, some people in your family say, proceed with caution. And you mentioned that your husband and wife said, just leave it alone. But part of you still wanted to find the truth. But when you discovered the truth and it was more than what you thought it was going to be, how was you able to process that internally with, with family, especially with writing the book? Um, it was hard, you know, uh, in general, I don't think I had a lot of support in pursuing this. And, um, but at that time I wasn't super involved like in the Lithuanian community. And so, you know, I had a lot of American friends and I was a, a journalist and I did really decide that it's more important to find out the truth than to cover it up. Um, and then when I, you know, was going for my MFA in Kentucky, there were no Lithuanians there. And the, and the professors, they were like, this is a really good story, you know, but you're gonna have to focus on just the Nazi occupation. That's the story. And the story is uh, you're coming to grips with this. And so uh, the way they, you know, I, ha I had like a whole different way of looking at it with their help. And that helped me a lot too. I don't think, if I were in Lithuania, I don't think I could have written this and still kept my job and everything. So I think because I was uh, Lithuanian in America, you know, with so many opportunities, and again, so lucky to be here, that um, I was able to do it. And I, 
I, you know, I was worried psychologically maybe, but I was never worried about losing my job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and speaking of um, your journalism career, you actually use some of your skill set as a journalist to write an article to raise awareness and to your surprise, it was picked up by the New York Times and Chicago Tribune, and then the, uh, Lithuania got a hold of it. Can you talk about um, that whole moment in time of everything just the raising awareness? Because like, you succeeded in what you wanted to do, but there was also some pushback as well. Well, I succeeded in raising awareness, but I didn't succeed in having Lithuania change its mind yeah. uh, over its role in the Holocaust. That, that still remains to get done. But um, I think, um, you know, the denial is very strong. The denial is very strong. This really gets at, it's traumatic. This is, this is really tra very traumatic for Lithuanians to come to terms with the idea that they had anything to do with killing Jews. The whole mindset of Lithuanians is that we are the victims. We're the victims of the Soviet occupation and the victims of the Nazi occupation. And somehow, despite all that, we've risen through the ashes and here we are, you know, a free country again. And that's all they know. So uh, for them to have to deal with this idea that they were involved in, kill in actively killing Jews um, is just very, very difficult and traumatic for them. Yeah. And Take it a step forward. Can you talk about your petition uh, to move, remove all honors from your grandfather? Sure. Uh, it's on my website. I had asked uh, for the removal, you know, changing the name of the school back to somebody else, maybe uh, someone who actually did save Jews, one of the 900. Um, because to me, they're the real heroes. And um, I did call for taking down the plaque. And I did call for, you know, he got that cross of the Vitas. Um, and it's, the, the thing is, is that it's true. He did, he did help fight against the communists. That part is heroic. But you have to also add in what he did during the Holocaust. And during the Holocaust, if he was involved in killing 8,000 Jews, that maybe weighs more, you know, is heavier than what he did as far as trying to fight against the communists. And... That just has never been brought into the whole narrative about him. Um, and my last question, and this really stuck out to me, just the phrase of like, just let history lie. And you, you, when you think of how powerful that is, and I wanted to ask you, how much do you think of the history is lying? And how many people are just allowing it to lie? And in you writing this book, do you think this will help push more truth out of there? Because there's so many stories out there that we may have never got it to her because we just let history lie. Yeah. Um, I think if it weren't for uh, this book, I don't think we would be even having this discussion. And I do think it is raising awareness and at least people are starting to talk about it and take it seriously. So I am happy about that, but there's still a lot. I don't know if it'll happen in my lifetime, to be honest. But at least there's something out there now to just begin talking about it. To me, the evidence is really heavy that he played a role. I don't see how anybody can look at it any other way. But that's how it is. Well, thank you. Thank and you. We're going to transition to the audience Q&A. Again, if you're um, viewing online, Please submit your questions. We'll, we will not ignore the, the chat in online as well. But if you have questions here, I'll run the mic to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. I can start us off with some questions from our virtual audience. Uh, there are quite a few people asking about your family's reaction to everything that you discovered. And kind of going along those lines, there was also a question whether you think your grandmother and your mother knew the truth? Uh, my brother has been very supportive about all of this, so, so he's good. My, my father kept asking, why does it have to be you? Why can't it just be some historian, you know, working at Jonas Nareka? And I generally would answer, I don't know, uh, Tete, you know, 
But I do know one thing that as his granddaughter, I think I might get more attention than just, you know, a regular historian. Um, so he was more worried for me than anything, um, you know, kind of had that fatherly protective side to him. But he still did not, he still did not believe that what I was finding out was true. But just this year, he finally read the book the second time. And he called me up and this is a big breakthrough. He said, oh, you know, Sylvia, maybe, maybe you're onto something. <laughs> so I think I got through dad. Um, so my mom, I don't think knew because she was not, uh, she was two years old in 1941. So I really don't think she knew. My grandfather, my grandmother though, I believe knew. And that's today, I think that that's why she tried to dissuade me from writing the book because by then I, I have a little stubborn streak and she knew what I was like and she probably guessed that if I come across this information I'm not just going to let it lie uh, so I think she would that's what I think today hi Sylvia thank you for this excellent presentation so you've talked a lot about um, the roadblocks you hit with the Lithuanian government. I'm just wondering if you could talk about, since you are having your book published in Lithuania, what is that like? Who are the people you met around the publication of the book? Just to look for a glimmer of hope, are there people who are accepting the truth and supporting you on that? Yes. Um, I'll, I, you know, in this year, March this year, uh, well, last year, Kitos Knigos, which means other books, uh, asked to take the manuscript and translate it into Lithuanian. And I literally was, you know, thinking that this book is going to be translated in every language but Lithuanian. That's how bad I thought it was going to be. So um, when they decided to take it on in Lithuanian, that's, I thought, wow, there really is a lot of hope now. So it's coming out in February and um, I think it'll make some kind of an impact. I just don't know how much. I think, I think because it's such a personal story and I think because, uh, it's told in like, an, like I don't shun my emotions as I discover the truth, which historians are like, oh, you have to be, you know, very neutral and you can't discuss this. But as his granddaughter, I almost exploit them in the story. And, um, and I think that that will help break open the discussion to just regular people in Lithuania, which it'll be easier to do, I hope. Hi, thank you so much for this presentation and for the book. I'm sure it was very traumatic going through all this, but I was wondering if you've been approached by maybe your counterparts. There are, for every hero, they all have families, and not just in Lithuania. Have you been approached by anyone else who wants to take your work further? What do you mean, like? Like maybe other, like other um, descendants, um, Lithuanian descendants, or even you know, Polish, other, you know, in other countries. How, I, I'm, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I'm understanding the question. Sorry. So, I mean, you are a granddaughter. Right. Of this Lithuanian hero. Mm -hmm. But there were, I'm sure there were other Lithuanian heroes, similarly. Oh, there are. And there are other descendants. And then not just in Lithuania, but in other countries that the Nazis Archetype. Have you been approached by anyone like that? Do you have any plans to maybe expand your work? I, I mean, think I know that yours is a, I know yours is a memoir, but it seems so, like, like you could really, you know, this is the beginning of something. I, yeah, I didn't know when I, you know, that this is part of a bigger picture of distortion, that there are other heroes in Lithuania also who played a role in the Holocaust. And in fact, some people said, your grandfather wasn't even the worst one. And, you know, as if like I was supposed to write about 
the worst one. And I'm like, well, that worst one is not my grandfather. Like, I kind of don't care about him. <laughs> so uh, the whole traumatic was that it was my grandfather. That's why I focused on him. So, um, but there, there is, um, you know, sort of hope movement that this book will break open this discussion about, you know, if you played a role in the Holocaust, maybe you should not be declared a hero. Like, end of story, you know. So I, I think it's trying to be used that way. I have another question from a virtual audience member. Um, this person is asking how to speak to naysayers. Uh, this person has cousins in Lithuania who uh, they spoke to about you and your book, um, or about your work, and they called you a liar and that you made things up. Um, so this person is asking how to respond to, to people who react that way. I blocked them on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, you know. The, you, well, first I say, do, have you read the book? And they're like, no, I wouldn't read it. I'm like, well, then that's kind of hard to have a discussion. So, and then if they're still attacking me after not reading my work, uh, and if it gets ugly, I, I'll just block them. That's it, because I've lost friends. I have lost friends. Thank you. <laughs> On your list of... Uh people who are responsible for killing Jews. You went from Hitler down to those who actually shot the Jews. Uh, right in the middle was uh, the folks who issued orders and the folks who translated orders. Was your grandfather one issuing orders or was he just translating orders? That's a great question. Um, he, as, as the chairman of Shole, he wrote about a thousand orders total. And of those thousand, about 70 had to do with the Holocaust. Of those 70, we found that three were written, originally written in German by uh, the Nazi, a Nazi German, Goeke, who was kind of, you know, who he reported to. So 67 other are just purely in Lithuanian. Uh, that order is a translation from the German, from the Germans, but my grandfather wrote all kinds of other little orders that only Lithuanian would know that other, like, like uh, one of the orders that was not translated or a letter was uh, discussing how to get barbed wire for that ghetto in Jagaria. So if he was an active resistor, why would he be worried about getting barbed wire? You know, so it's just these other, uh, uh, other 67 orders that he wrote that were not translated at all. So he wrote, he wrote orders himself, too. There, there were three we discovered that were translations, but he actively collaborated, and it seemed like he did everything he could to help. There's another question from a virtual audience member. Um, who wonders specifically about American Lithuanians' responses to your work? Uh, there are some very good supporters. Uh, they're my, in a minority, though. Um, in general, uh, I would say that, and I, I don't know, more than half are really against it. Um, Sylvia, so this is um, coming from a group of my friends, and for everybody who cares, we grew up, we've known each other for a long time, I'm Lithuanian. Some of the very closest people to me object to what you've presented because of where you're gathering your archives, your sources of information, for example, and I'll bring it up very delicately because I'm here, I, I'm in. She had big object objections about even Andrus Kulikauskas, who is not 
exactly respected. Actually, a few people have brought up his name as somebody that you cannot gather credible information from because of who he is. So how do you how do you um, counter people who say that? They're, they're basically saying, well, her basis, her research is not credible. He didn't make up what he found. He found the documents. He's the one who really dug in through the Soleil archives where my grandfather was, um, you know, working for. And so he's the one who dug them up and he's the one who looked through it. And um, say what you will about him, the documents speak for themselves. They're all primary source documents. So um, that's my response. Okay, uh, we have one last question from another virtual audience member who asks if you feel that the people who are being critical of your work and saying that you're a liar, et cetera, do you believe that that is based in anti-Semitism or is that more of a denial and inability to face the truth of the past? I don't know. That's a good question. I think because I lived through that denial myself for 10 years, I think most of it is just that psychological difficulty to accept that Lithuanians actually did play an active role in killing Jews. I think that the trauma is so deep and so painful that it's, you know, the natural response is to avoid pain. And so I think that, that it's more that, which is not to say that there is also, there, I mean, there is also anti-Semitism, but I think it's more this national identity having to be part of that. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have for, for this afternoon, but I wanna thank you all again for joining us in person and virtually. And I want to thank you, Sylvia, for this. Um, it's a very sensitive topic, but you bravely wrote the book and you bravely answered all the questions. And I truly appreciate you coming here and supporting us. Thank you, Raheem. Thank you.